I'd be surprised if I get through the entire first section. I've only got two portions prepared and uh, it's going to be like Elijah. It's not going to be just a brief look. Uh, sometimes you might wonder where I'm going with things, but it's all connected to our study on heaven here. A lot of times we don't talk about heaven, but we need to. So as we begin tonight, we'll talk about its hope. Colossians 1.3 says, We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ for the hope which is laid up for us in heaven. The hope of heaven. You know, it's a sad fact, but there's so many people out there who have an idea that heaven is only a matter of speculation. It's a figment of religious fanatics' imagination. There's a world out there like that. Now think about this. As we begin this study, God would have not included so much in Scripture about heaven if he didn't want to leave the human race in darkness about it. He wants us to know there's a place. He wants us to know about it. Do we know everything there is to know about heaven? No. And we won't until we get there. But we know, like let's, we read in 2 Timothy chapter 3, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfectly, for be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. What the Bible has to say about heaven is just as true as everything else it tells us. The Bible is true. The Bible's inspired and every word is true. It's absolute truth. The things we know about heaven, the things which are taught in the Holy Word, could not have come to us in any other way, any other manner, any other form, except by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. There's no person who knows anything about heaven except what God has revealed to us. If we want to find out anything about heaven, there's only one place we can turn, and that's the Bible. The best proof that the Bible is being the true Word of God is to be found between the two covers of your Bible. The Bible proves itself. It does, time after time. In this respect, it is like Jesus Christ, whose character proclaim the divinity of his person. You saw Jesus, you saw God. Christ showed himself more than man by what he did. The Bible shows itself more than a human book by what it says. It's not, however, because the Bible is written with a more human skill or not that it far surpasses uh, Shakespeare or any other human author and its knowledge of character and its eloquence it contains. It's, it's far beyond the power of man to write this. And we believe that it's inspired. Man's ideas differ about the extent of, to which human skill can be carried out. But the reason why we believe the Bible is inspired is simply because it, it's so simple that the humblest child of God can comprehend it. The proof of its divine origin lay in its wisdom alone. A simple, uneducated man might not be able to believe it. But everybody can. The uneducated can believe it. The educated. We believe it's inspired because there is nothing in it that could have come from any place but from God. God is wise. God is good. There's nothing in the Bible that is not wise. There's nothing in the Bible that's not good. The Bible, if the Bible had anything in it that was opposed to reason, or if it contained something that, to our sense of right, then perhaps we might think it was like all the other books of men that's written in this world. Nothing special about it. Books that are only human, like merely human lives, 
having them a great deal that is foolish and a great deal that is wrong. I'm sure we've all read books and this foolishness, some of these things. The life of Christ alone was perfect, being both human and divine. No one of the other volumes, like the, the Quran, for example, contains divinity of origin or even agrees with common sense. If you read these other books, these false writings, you'll see that. But there's nothing at all in the Bible that does not conform to common sense. What it tells us about the world having been des destroyed by the flood and knowing his family alone being saved is no more wonderful, no more grabbing of the imagination for people than what's taught in the schools that the earth and all we see here now was brought about by a great big ball of fire, which is easier to believe. And uh, that God's the truth or man's speculation. It is a great deal easier to believe that man was made after the image of God than to believe as so many of our young people are being taught day after day that we're an offspring of a monkey. Where'd the monkey come from? Anyway. Like all the other wonderful works of God, this Bible that we hold before us bears the same sure stamp of its author. It's like him. The Bible is like God. It's his word. Though man plants seeds, God grows the flowers. He makes them. And they're perfect and they're beautiful just like himself. Men wrote what is in the Bible, but it is the work of God. Yeah, man may plant seeds, God makes the flowers. Mere men, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote the Bible, but it's the work of God. The more refined as a rule people are, the fonder they are of flowers, isn't it? And the better they are as a rule, the more they love the Bible. The closer you are to the Lord, the more you're going to love it. The fondness for flowers refines people, and the love of the Bible makes them better. All that's in the Bible about God, about man, about redemption, and about a future state agrees up with all our own ideas of right and wrong, with our reasonable fears and our personal experiences. All the historical events are described in a way that we know that the world had of looking at them at the time they were written. We're looking at first-hand reports and they're written by men who were there. What the Bible tells us about heaven is not as strange as the scientists who try to tell us what's beyond the stars far out of the, the range of any telescope that we have. And yet people will take science as a fact and religion is a fancy. They tell us what they think about something that they can't see. There's a lot of people out there who think Jupiter and many other stars might be inhabited, but they cannot bring themselves to believe that there is beyond this earth a life for immortal souls. The true Christian puts faith before reason and believe that reason goes along and has faith by its side. If people only read the Bible more, and if they would only study what there is to be found within the pages, they would find out a great deal about heaven. And they would not be as worldly minded as they are today. They would not have their hearts set upon things down here, but they would be thinking about the imperishable things above. Now, a little, that was a little introduction. Let's go to the, my first point here. Earth, the home of sin. We may not think of it that way, but it is, isn't it? It seems perfectly, perfectly reasonable to me that God should have given us a glimpse of the future. For we are constantly losing some of our friends to death, family members, and the first thought that comes to mind is, where have they gone? For the believers, we know. But the world asks, where have they gone? When a loved one is taken from us, oh, it comes, that come thought comes into our minds. How we wonder who will ever see them again, 
where and, and when that will happen. Then it's that we turn to the blessed book. That's why we turn to the Bible, or we should, for there's no other book in all of the world that can give us the slightest bit of comfort during those times. Several times over the years, I've met someone I haven't seen for a long time, and once I remember their name, which is usually the hard part, I may ask about their family. Think about this. Let's say you meet someone that's lived in a situation such as Job, and you ask them about their family. Their answer would be something like, I haven't got a family anymore. What? Is your wife dead? Yes, sir, and all my children are gone too. I'm left desolate and alone. Would anybody take the hope of that man of seeing his family again? Would anyone persuade him that there is not a future where the lost will be found? No. You know, we, we needn't forget our dear loved ones. We may cling forever to the enduring hope that there will be a time and we will meet them again unfettered in the land that's blessed of eternal day where the soul drinks of the living water that rolled by the throne of God. There are sadly many people who say there is no heaven. You know why they say that? If they could convince themselves there's no heaven, then they're sure there is no hell. That's the reason they do that. But you talk to someone who said, uh, maybe he thinks that there's nothing that can justify us in believing in any other heaven than right down here on earth. Have you ever heard people say, well, this is heaven down here. If this is heaven, I don't want to go. This isn't heaven down here. If this is heaven, it's a strange one. It's a world of sickness, it's a world of sorrow, and it is a world of sin. I pity from the depths of my heart a person who has the idea that this is heaven. This world that some think is heaven is nothing more than the home of sin, a hospital of sorrow, a place that has nothing in it to satisfy the soul. You know, men travel all over it. People go all over the world and then they get, you know, what do they get out of it? Other than spending a lot of money. People soon grow tired of the, the best pleasures that the world has to offer. Someone said that the world is a stormy sea whose every wave is scattered with the wrecks of mortals that perish in it. Every time we take a breath, someone in the world is dying. We all know that we're going to stay here for just a very little while. In the scope of eternity, less than a blink of an eye. Life is a vapor. It's only a shadow. We meet one another, as someone said, salute one another, pass on, and are gone. And that's pretty quick, isn't it? As we get on the closer end to making the journey, we realize how fast this life goes. Another person has said, it is just an inch of time. And then eternal ages roll on. And it seems to me that it is perfectly reasonable that we should study the book, the Bible, to find out where we are going, where our friends are who have gone before. The longest time man has to live has no more proportion to eternity than a drop of water in the ocean. That's it. Isn't it? I want to look at a minute, moment at the cities of the past. I know you're thinking, how is he going to tie all this into heaven? I'm kind of like Barry now. You'll probably have to come back next week to see it start getting tied in, but I think you'll understand as we go through the study. If we look at the cities of the past, there's Babylon, of course. It's said to have been founded by a queen named Ceramus, who had two million men work for years in building that city. You know what? It's nothing but dust now. Nearly a thousand years ago, a historian wrote 
about the ruins of Nebuchadnezzar's palace. They were still standing, but men were afraid to go anywhere near it because it was filled with snakes and scorpions. Now that's a, that's a sort of ruin that greatness often comes to in our own day. None of us gone. Its towers, its bastions have all fallen. The traveler who tries to go and see Carthage, they can't find much of it. Corinth, once a seat of luxury and art, is a shapeless mess today. Ephesus, that was the metropolitan of Asia, the Paris of its day, the major city. It was crowded with buildings, large as the capital that we have at Washington. And I'm told it looks more now like a neglected graveyard than anything else. Granada was once so grand with its 12 gates and towers now in decay. Alhambra, the palace of the Mohammed kings, it was situated there. Little pieces of this once grand and beautiful city it's of Herculeum and Pompeii are now being sold in shops as souvenir relics. <clears throat> Jerusalem, the joy of the whole earth, is but a shadow of what it was once. Thebes, a thousand years ago, was almost up, almost up to the coming of Christ, was among the largest and wealthiest cities in the world. It's now massive decay. But the little ancient Athens and many more of the proud cities of old times remain to tell us the story of their downfall. God drives his plowshare through cities and they are upheaved just like you're plowing a field. Behold, says Isaiah, the nations are as a drop of the bucket and are counted as small dust of the balance. Behold, he hath taken the isles as a very little thing. All nations before him are as nothing. They are counted to him less than nothing and vanity. Isaiah 40, 15 and 11. See how Antioch has fallen. When Paul preached there, it was a great metropolitan area. The wide street was three miles long. Stretching across the entire city was rows and rows of columns, covered galleries. Every, every corner stood carved statues to, con 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 to pay homage to great men whose names we've never heard of and never will. These men are now gone. No one remembers them. But the poor preaching tent maker who went there, into the, he's one of the grandest characters of history, speaking of Paul. The finest specimens of Grecian art are decor that decorated the, the shrines and temples and baths and aqueducts were such as they never approached in elegance now. Men now as, as then were seeking honor, wealth, renown, enshrining their names and the, the records in perishable clay. Within the walls of Antioch, we're told, were enclosed hills over 700 feet high. Rocky cliffs and deep ravines gave a wide and picturesque character of the place which no modern city can match. These heights were fortified in a marvelous manner which gave them strange and startling effect. The vast, the vast population of this city combined all the art, cultivation of Greece, with all its levity and luxury and superstition of Asia, was intent on, oh, they were intent on pleasure. The entire population, just like our great cities today. Citizens, had, they had their shows, their games, their races, their dances, their sorceries, their puzzles. They had buffoons, they had miracle workers. And the people constantly went to theaters and processions because they wanted to be stimulated, they wanted to be entertained, they wanted to be feel gratified. All because of their human nature. This is pretty much what we find in the masses of people 
in our great cities now. Antioch was even worse than Athens, for the so-called worship they indulged in was mere idolatry and had mixed up with the grossest passions to which any man can descend. But it was here that Paul came to preach the glad tidings of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was there that the disciples were first called Christians. It wasn't as a nickname, it was an insult. All followers of Christ before that time were called saints or brethren. Now we don't look at Christians in a negative term. As has been well said, out of the spring of Antioch, a mighty storm has flowed to the water of the world. Astari, the queen of heaven, whom they worshipped, Diana and Apollo and the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and other no more. But you know what? The despised Christians are still with us. Yet that heathen city, which would not take Christianity to its heart, keep it, it fell, as did all these cities. Cities that have not the refining and restraint of Christianity, well established in them, seldom do amount to much in the long run. If you look through history, the cities and the nations that have rejected God, violated His commands, they're no more. Their light grows dim. Few of our great cities in this country are only a couple hundred years old. And for nearly a thousand years, that city prospered and it fell. You know, one day we're going to travel. I'm going to get to heaven eventually. I'm not talking about my life, I'm talking about studying. But we're going to travel. Do you think that it's wrong for us to think and talk about heaven? No. I'd like to locate heaven. I'd like to find out all I can about it. I expect to live there for a pretty long time, eternity. If I were going to dwell in a different place in this country, if I were going to make someplace my new home, I'd want to make inquiries, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you want to find out all about that place? Wouldn't you want to know about the climate, your neighbors, and above everything else? I want to learn everything I can concerning that place I want to move. If any of you were going to relocate, isn't that what you would do? Isn't that the way you feel about it? You want to find out something? Well, we're all going to relocate in a very little while to a country that's far away. We're going to spend eternity in another world, a grand and glorious place where God reigns. It's not natural then that we should look and listen and try to find out who is already there and what is the route to take. You have to have a good road map to go somewhere, don't you? We have a road map. It's called the Bible. An unbeliever once asked a newly converted Dwight L. Moody why he looked up when he prayed. Well, that unbeliever said that heaven was no more above than below. He said heaven was everywhere. Well, Dwight Moody said he was pretty bewildered. And the next time he prayed, he seemed like he was just praying in the air. After that time, Moody got better acquainted with the Bible. See, we, think, we hear about Dwight Moody, we think about the great preacher. But he had to, he's like all of us. He had to learn. He had to read. He had to study. And as he became better acquainted with the Bible, he came to understand that heaven is above. It's upward, not downward. Now, the Spirit of God is everywhere. We know that. But God is in heaven, and heaven is above our heads. It doesn't matter what part of the globe that you live, heaven is above you. In the 17th chapter of Genesis, it says that God went up from Abraham. And in the third chapter of John, the Son of Man came down from heaven. So in the first chapter of Acts, we find that Christ went up to heaven, not down, and a cloud received Him out of His sight. So I think just without going into a lot of detail, we know one thing, heaven is up. The Bible tells us clearly. 
The very arrangement of the firmament above the earth declares the seat of God's glory to be above us. Job says over in Job uh, 3, 4, let not God reign from above. Psalm 113, 4, the psalmist says, the Lord is high above all nations and his glory is above the heavens. Deuteronomy 30, 12 says, who shall go up for us to heaven? So throughout all the scripture, we find the location of heaven is upward beyond the firmament. So we know the direction now, physically. The firmament with its bright world scattered throughout, you can see them on a clear night, is so vast that heaven must be a very extensive realm. Yet that shouldn't surprise you. It's not for the short-sighted man to inquire why God made heaven so extensive that it's light, so, but it actually lights along the way, doesn't it? No matter what part of the world you're in, those lights show you the way. Jeremiah 51, 15, we're told that he hath made the earth by his power. He hath established the world by his wisdom and hath stretched out the heavens by his understanding. Yet how little we really know of that power or wisdom or understanding. Job 26, 14, Lo, these are parts of his ways, but how little a portion is heard of him, but the thunder of his power. Who can understand? That's the word of God. We find in Isaiah 42, 42 5, this. Thus saith the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, he that giveth bread unto the people upon it, and the Spirit to them that walk within. The discernment of God's power, the messages of heaven, do not always come in great things. 1 Kings 19.12, you might remember this from our study on Elijah we just finished. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains. That's timing, isn't it? In the wind and break it in pieces the rocks before the Lord but the Lord was not in the wind and after the wind an earthquake but the Lord was not in the earthquake and after the earthquake a fire but the Lord was not in the fire and after that fire a still small voice it's with that still small voice that God speaks to his children some people are trying to find out how far Heaven is away. Now we're all old enough to remember the name Nikita Khrushchev. Y'all remember him? He once said that there was no heaven because they sent rockets up there and they couldn't find it. Well, I tell you, if you believe in Star Trek it's at the speed of light, you're not going to get there that way. God speaks of still small voices. And heaven is a distance from us, but there's one thing we know about it. Heaven is not so far away that God cannot hear you when you pray. And I, and I do not believe that there's ever been a tear shed for sin since Adam that the Lord has not witnessed. He's not too far from earth that we can go to Him. And if there's a sigh that comes from that burdened heart today, God will hear it. If there's a cry going up from the, the broken heart on the count of sin, God will hear that cry. He's not so far away. Heaven's not so far away that, that it's inaccessible to the smallest child of God. In 2 Chronicles we read, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and will heal their land. 7.14 There was a father who lost his only son. The father had not thought too much about the future. He had been entirely taken up by the affairs of this world. But when that little boy, his only child, died, the father's heart was broken. And every night when he returned from work, 
He, he would be found in his room with a candle burning, reading the Bible, hunting all he could, everything he could find out about heaven. Someone asked him what he was doing. He said he was trying to find out where his son had gone. I think he was a reasonable man. God used that to bring him to study and believe. I guess no one will ever hear this study who has never had a dear one that has passed on. Are we going to close this book today and, or shall we look into it and try to find where our loved ones may be? I was reading some time ago about a account of a father who was a minister and he lost his child. He had gone to a great many funerals. He had offered comfort to others in sorrow. But now that scorching iron had come on him, entered his soul, and a brother minister came and to officiate preached a funeral sermon. After the sermon, that minister was standing at the head of the coffin. He said that a few years ago when he first came to that pulpit, that he used to look across the river and he had no real interest in those people who lived over there because they were not part of his church family. They were not part of his congregation. But he said a few years after that, a young man came to his home, married his daughter, and they went to live on the other side of that river. And when his child went over there through death, he suddenly became interested in the inhabitants over there, just like the inhabitants of heaven, and every morning he said he would get up and he would look across that river to her home. But now he said, another child has been taken. She has gone over the river and heaven seems dearer and nearer to me than it ever has before. And that's sometimes we need to take a look at that. Christians, let us believe this good old book. We need to be confident. It's not a book of myths. Heaven's not a myth. We need to be prepared to follow our dear ones who have gone on before. So that and that alone can we find peace. Let me see if I how much farther I can go tonight. All right. I've got 10 minutes. I'm going to try. Seeking a better country. What has been in it is now one of the strongest feelings of the human heart. What is that strong feeling? Is it not to find a better place, to love a lovelier spot than we have? Don't we want something better? It's for this that men are seeking everywhere. And they have, you know, they have, uh, if you will, but instead of looking down, they must look up to find it. They're not going to find it in this world. They'll find it in Jesus Christ. As men grow in knowledge, they buy with each other more and more in taking their homes, making their homes more attractive. But the brightest home on earth is no more than an empty barn compared to the mansions that are prepared for us in the sky. What is it that we look for at the decline and the close of our life? What are we looking for? And it's some sheltered place, a quiet spot, where if we cannot have constant rest, we may at least have a foretaste of the rest that is to be for us. What was it that led Columbus, not knowing what would be his fate across an unsailed sea, if it were not the hope of finding a better country? It was the same with the hearts of the Pilgrim Fathers, driven from their native land by persecution. They landed on a savage coast and an unexplored territory, but they were cheered and they upheld by the hope of reaching a free and fruitful country where they could rest and worship God in peace. Somewhat similar to is the Christian's hope of heaven. Only it is not an undiscovered country. And the attractions cannot be compared with anything that we know on earth. If you're going to try to compare 
heaven and earth, forget it. It's, you can't do it. Perhaps nothing but a shortness of our range of sight keeps us from seeing that celestial gates open for us. Maybe nothing but the deafness of our spiritual ears prevents us from hearing the joyful bells of heaven ringing. There are constant sounds around us that we cannot hear. The sky is studded with the bright worlds out there that the, our eyes have never seen. Little as we know about the bright and radiant land, there are glimpses of its beauty that come to us every now and then of heaven. It's said by travelers who are climbing the Alps that they can look at the distant villages and they can see, even at great distances, houses so clear. They can even count the windows in the churches. The distance looks so short from that place, but the traveler keeps journeying and journeying for hours and hours, and yet he seems to be no nearer to it. That's because of the clearness of the atmosphere, of course. By perseverance, however, that place is finally reached, and the tired traveler can find rest. So sometimes we dwell in high altitudes of grace. That's when heaven seems so very real to us, so very near, and the hills of Beulah land are in full view. Other times, the clouds and fogs caused by suffering and sin cut off our sight altogether. We are just as near heaven in one case as we are the other, but we are just as sure of gaining it if we only keep the path that Christ has pointed out. You're saved by grace through faith. I've read that on the shores of the Adriatic Sea that the fishermen would go out and into the deep and the husbands would be gone and the women would gather at the shore of the sea in the evenings and they would sing the first hymn of a verse out to the ocean. And they would wait. And before long, they would hear that second hymn coming back with them in answering it. So perhaps if we would listen, we might hear that storm-tossed world of ours and some sound, some whisper, something from far off. Heaven is our home. When we sing our hymns upon the shores of this earth, perhaps we may hear the echoes breaking the music upon the sands of time and cheering the hearts of those who are pilgrims and strangers along the way. Yes, we need to look up. We need to go out beyond this low earth and build a higher in our thoughts and actions that ever before. You know, when a man is going up in a balloon, I'm not going to do that, by the way, but when they go up, they take sandbags for ballast. When they want to go higher, they throw out a bag. They empty more sand, they go higher and higher. So, the more we have to throw out the things of this world, the nearer we're going to be to God. We have to see our life as that balloon. And we want to get nearer to God. Throw out those things. Let go of them. Let us not set our hearts on the affections of the things of this world. But do what the Master tells us. Lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. And I will have.